Hey folks, defending your prepper retreat would be much like a settler defending their homestead or small community back during the French and Indian War. Today I'm going to go over some uh, defensive uh, principles that can be used for homestead defense in a WROL situation. Now these are drawn from uh, both military tactics, uh, infantry in the defense, field fortifications, etc. They're drawn from my experience having hardened uh, several dozen homes in, in combat zones, uh, several uh, ministry facilities, government ministry facilities, um, and several uh, client uh, office facilities. Uh, and they're going to be drawn from similar parallel situations in history. Uh, I won't go back as the French and Indian War, but there are two modern parallels, uh, one of which was the remote rubber plantation farmers uh, in Malaya in the 1950s during the Malayan emergency, and more recently, uh, Rhodesian farmers and to a lesser extent, South African farmers uh, during the 1970s. Now, during my research for this video, uh, I came across a, a really good website, and I'd like to give that gentleman a shout out. It's a, it's a blog, uh, thelizardfarmer.com, and I'll put a link to that below. Uh, what I'm trying to do here, he does in minute detail uh, in, in a blog fashion. So he's got diagrams, etc. And I, I would strongly advise you in your studies of this topic to, to go ahead and, and uh, visit his website. Uh, also, I'd like to recommend uh, The Farmer at War, which uh, I'll put a link to, and this is a book specifically about the uh, Rhodesian farmers um, during the Rhodesian insurgency, and it's available free online. Uh, also, one book for you to check out on this would be The War of the Running Dogs by Noel Barber, which talks about the uh, Malayan emergency. So what parallels can we draw between uh, settlers on the frontier, Malayan rubber, rubber farmers, uh, Rhodesian farmers, and our own WROL retreat? Well, we're in family groups or, or small communities, uh, backups nowhere to be found, and we've got to improvise with what we've got to protect ourselves. What I'd like for you to be able to take away from this video is just a, a, at least a general overview or a knowledge that you need to reach out and get more information on uh, terrain appre appreciation and risk assessment, defense in depth, and also thinking outside the box, which is a big part of it. We'd all love to have that uh, doomsday castle and just the ultimate and in, in doomsday defenses but the reality of it is is you might be in a tiny apartment you might be in a subdivision what you've got is what you've got and that's what you've got to work with so it's important that you understand and appreciate the terrain around you your defenses your weaknesses uh, and what you need to defend and what you can give up prior to WROL and then forever more after WROL you need to keep this running risk assessment in your head uh, based on uh, intelligence, based on the lay of the land, uh, things that you've heard, uh, evidence that you've seen about who would attack you, uh, where those attacks would come from, what sort of enemy forces it would be, uh, size, activity, location, unit, uh, time, and equipment. With the knowledge of the risk, uh, you can then look at understanding the terrain so that you can use it to your advantage to dominate your, your own area of operations uh, and set it up so that it will advantage you in any engagement. Now, I'll give you an acronym to use for uh, terrain appreciation. Uh, you may have, might have heard this uh, with the letters rearranged differently. That's fine. And that's COCO or COCOA. Uh, and what this is, is a method for terrain appreciation that you can apply directly. If you'll take a walk around your neighborhood or the woods around your house, 
and stop and look and identify terrain features and once you're used to using this you can apply it to any location that you have to defend and basically what this stands for is key terrain observation of fields of fire cover and concealment obstacles and avenues of approach or egress now let's first talk about key terrain key terrain is essentially anything that can be used by either side any terrain feature which can be used by either side to gain advantage of the other side this can be a hill a ridge line a finger a tower a building whatever and knowing this includes deciding how you would deal with it uh, place obstacles to deny access occupy it yourself booby traps cover by fire Next is observation of fields of fire. Observation of fields of fire, uh, preppers in general will have di direct fire weapons. And by direct fire weapons, I mean rifles and shotguns and the like, versus indirect fire weapons such as mortars, grenade launchers, etc. Now, observation of your fields of fire and seeing what your fields of fire are, you want to decide what areas can be covered by fire from your primary position, your secondary position, and your alternate position. Your primary and secondary positions are two positions that can achieve your primary objective to cover the approach to your home, for example. Your alternate position is a different position that serves a different purpose, meaning if they come up the riverbed out back, I'm going to need to move to my alternate position. Along with this is how can we improve our observation of fields of fire? Can we fell trees, uh, burn off shrubbery? Next is cover and concealment. First thing, know the difference between the two. If you hide behind some bushes, you might be concealed, but you don't have cover from enemy fire. Now, what cover and concealment improvements can we make for us? and how can we mitigate cover and concealment for the enemy. With this comes an important term, and that's dead space. Dead space is any area that you cannot cover with your direct fire weapons. This can be the blind side of your house. This can be walls, stranded vehicles, riverbeds, draws, anything that your enemy can hide behind that you cannot engage him. Do you remember in the new version of the Alamo when Davy Crockett led the foray outside the wall to burn down that, that shed? Well, that was dead space. Uh, someone could hide in it or hide behind it and they couldn't be engaged by fire. Obstacles. Obstacles are anything that you put up to deny access to the enemy or to channel the enemy in the direction you want him to go. In military doctrine, an unobserved obstacle is useless because the enemy can dismantle the obstacle. However, for prepper uses in the extreme outer edge of our area of operations, an unobserved obstacle can be made to look as if it were accidental, such as a fallen tree or a vehicle uh, that's blocking the road with the tires flattened and apparently a, a dead vehicle. These can have the bonus of rerouting your enemy away from you or of forcing your enemy to dismount before they approach your position. And one weakness we, we have as, as preppers is similar to the frontiersmen of, of the French and Indian War uh, or the other scenarios that we've talked about is there aren't many of us. Uh, even if we band into small communities, we are not going to have enough guns to cover all the areas that we need to cover. Therefore, if we make our obstacles, such as wire entanglements, so that they channel or funnel our enemy towards us, we can funnel them directly into our firing positions. Even trained troops will tend to take the path of least resistance. What can we use? We can use trees, we can use vehicles, we can use loads and loads of barbed wire. Everyone prefers the, the razor wire now, uh, but you can even find 
uh, goat fencing or barbed wire, old style barbed wire uh, on sale at your local farm supply store and put that to use. Uh, sure, it's not as great as the, the razor wire, but that old barbed wire, you can develop some massive obstacles with it. And even a chain link fence of the type that you might have around your house, you can pop the caps off it, put stakes to extend it up higher and use barbed wire to improve it. And it's something that you can commonly get. Now, another good thing is we can learn a lot from history because mankind has been building fortifications since we had civilization. Uh, and it doesn't have to all be sandbags, which are expensive. Um, razor wire and the like. HESCOs are a, a really uh, great tool that you've seen used a lot uh, over in Afghanistan and Iraq. And it was actually invented by a British soldier who was tired of filling sandbags. And what these are, are great giant baskets with sort of a felt liner filled with dirt. Sure, you're not going to call the HESCO company and order a whole bunch of these, but you can make your own with uh, fence posts, chain link, and some of the uh, landscaping fabric. But this isn't the first time they've been used. Uh, they've been used for, for years and years. And don't forget about uh, placing effective uh, vehicle barriers. Now, you're not going to be able to do the deluxe type of store-bought uh, vehicle barriers that you'll see around public buildings now. Uh, but you've got to improvise. And, and we do have a better understanding today. I, I think even the common, common man has a better understanding today of what it takes to actually stop a vehicle. Uh, it's not the little pole with stripes on it, but it's got to be much more. Uh, and you can do this with either... Um, fallen trees or or dirt log emplacements or improving existing vehicle ditches now these layers these concentric circles that give you this defense in depth they continue right up to your house and even with within it you can have entrenchments just outside your house you can take and stack firewood five feet out from the wall of your house and create a curtain wall that'll give you a means to move around your house while under fire or a position to fire from. I couldn't find any pictures of that, but these pictures shown, I wouldn't stack the wood right up against the house due to fire hazard and termite hazard, but I'd make the stack three to six feet away from the house. It's about thinking outside the box. Do you remember in the movie 28 Days Later when they, they finally found the, the uh, apartment with the taxi driver and, and his daughter and, and they try to approach and they found this, this huge obstacle of shopping carts that the guy had piled up at the bottom of the stairs. That's using what you've got available and thinking outside the box. What type of materials can you use and where can you get it? Well, it depends where you are and, and, and what you have available. The natural trees, uh, you might be able to find stocks of railroad ties. You might be able to have access to the currently unused school bus garage and take all the school buses as obstacles. You might find chain link or you might have lumber you can make homemade shutters, could put bars across the window. You can build safe rooms within your house for non-combatants or a last ditch place to go. And look at this, this is called a man trap. We used it a lot in Afghanistan. Now picture somebody thinking that, that they're about to, to bust in they kick down your door and they find one of these with you across the room behind a, a prepared position and they're stuck inside it. 
All it takes is some 2x4s, chain link, uh, fencing staples, and your imagination. It doesn't have to be as, as uh, welded industrial strength thing. Uh, you've just got to get it up there. Uh, the thing about uh, defenses that you have to remember, all of this that you have to remember, is continuous improvement. You need to keep working on it and making it better and better. So it winds up being a roach motel that they can get in a, into, but they can't check out of. Avenues of approach and egress. Avenues of approach, as I said earlier, are the routes that, that the enemy can use to approach your position. Now, this can be along the road, across an open field, up a riverbed, or whatever. And we talked a little bit about how we're going to handle those avenues of approach. Now, I also want to, you to think about avenues of egress. What if we're being overwhelmed and we have to withdraw from our position? Which way will we go? Also, with avenues of, of approach, I want you to think about if we have reinforcements coming, how will they enter? So what will be their avenue of approach? Now, along those same lines, who is coming to get you? What are they bringing and how are they getting to you? Got to work on your procedures. If you are a, a tightly knit community uh, spread out over a, a large area, what is going to be the communication? Is it going to be the sound of gunfire? Is it going to be the church bell? Is it going to be an air horn? What is going to happen? And then are there set rally points out in the woods where these people can meet up to respond to you? When they're responding to you, what are their actions when they get there? Will they come all the way in? How will they communicate that they're coming in? Uh, or will they simply attack the attacking force from, from behind? Now you've got all this together and you've got all this this built uh, you're continuously improving on it well you cannot just stay locked down in your house and that's it you've got to get out and you've got to work which makes you vulnerable outside of your immediate vicinity you're going to have outposts and these are camouflage positions which your people can observe and look for anyone attempting to move in to your area of operations. At night, you'll bring those in a little bit closer and they'll be called listening posts. To tie it all together, you need to run patrols. Patrols need to patrol not only your area of operations, but they need to probe outside your area of operations to gather intelligence so you can continue to perform your risk assessments and know what's coming to, towards you before they get there. Talking a little bit more uh, about procedures, everyone should know their position to go to when an attack is occurring. Their primary, their secondary, their alternate position. Uh, as, as I said before, manning is always a problem with preppers. So you might have your 10 year olds watching the alternate position so he can at least come and report to you that someone's approaching. You might want to look at different ways that you can employ deception and camouflage. This is especially true now that we're in the age of the drone and any knucklehead can strap a camera to a drone. And each position that you man needs to have a range card. A range card is basically a map drawn of that position what you can see, what you can't see, what your fields of view are, what your fields of fire are. And it's important that if at all possible, when you make your positions, you have interlocking fields of fire. Some other things to think about is what about the wounded? How are you going to retrieve your wounded? And what if you do have to evacuate? How are you going to evacuate the wounded? Where are you going to evacuate to? Not only do you need a route of egress, is you need a rally point in case you're all trickling out in dribs and drabs. And what is the final destination? Is it another homestead down the road? You might look at and consider perimeter alarms, either the type that use 22 blank cartridges or even better, the silent electronic type ones.
electric fencing, and even booby traps. Be forewarned though, planting booby trap in a state where we do have rule of law is illegal in most jurisdictions. Now that you've gotten it all together, gather your group, sit down, start to discuss it, and when everyone seems to have a clear understanding, build a sand table. A sand table is a small model of your area of operations. And then you can talk through different scenarios and make sure everyone understands everyone else's plan, your means of communication to each other, and what weak points need to be mitigated through further work. This is a whole heck of a lot of material and I can't quite do it justice in this already long video. I'm going to go through a few just different scenarios real quick just to, to explain the concepts a little bit more. So you're in your homestead prepper doomsday castle and there you are locked up tight. But if you just go on lockdown, you're blind to what's going on outside and anyone can approach. So you employ outer obstacles to force your enemy to dismount. Then you apply obstacles such as wire closer in to channel your enemy to your firing positions. Then you're going to place OPLPs out so that you can see what's approaching. And then you're going to run patrols to reach out further and gather intel. Another example, here's your house in a gated subdivision. Identify the avenues of approach for the greater area and employ obstacles. Look at the avenues of approach to the house itself and develop your fields of fire. In this example, you've got the perfect little prepper homestead bordered by a national forest. It's only got one avenue of approach up a road, but it does have a campsite and two boat ramps further up the road, which could draw people who knew about it. They're going to employ an outer roadblock that seems accidental, like fallen trees, and then a close-in observed or manned vehicle checkpoint. Looking close in at their defenses, you can see their uh, outposts and listening posts denoted by triangles, their checkpoints, fields of fire, and their avenue of egress to a rally point if they have to evacuate. As I said, this is a whole lot to absorb and you're not going to get it just from looking at one video. This should be enough to give you the broad brush concept of it and you've got some sources to do some further study. Thanks for your time. Stay safe.